thank you for for joining us. It's an honour to be talking to one of our guests of honours and and um, at the point of being a year out. Um, so you're involved in a special project for Glasgow in 2024. Could you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, thanks, Megan. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm I got and was asked by my friend the very skilled and renowned, in fact, composer Gary Lloyd to uh, to, to do the the script, as I ignorantly call it, for an opera, and oh, to think of a story for an opera, and I thought about that, and uh, we I came up with a notion, which had been a story idea even a novel idea that had been on my mind for some time. And that was a story with the title Morrow's Isle. And the basis for it, as Gary and I um, kind of brainstormed, was the island of Dr. Moreau, as imagined by the men who stare at goats. <laughs> the Men Who Stare at Goats is a famous uh, book and film about the bizarre paranormal research that the US military carried out in the 70s and 80s. And I knew exactly what little island in the first of Clyde I could set this story on. And Gary was very keen on the idea and we talked it over. And I started writing and I sent Gary what I thought was a quarter of an hour long opera and he told me that I'd written like an hour's worth of singing oh god <laughs> and I'd been imagine I think what I had been imagining was something like a musical oh. and I learned very quickly from Gary that this is not what an opera is <laughs> this is not what what we were planning, but we we ha we have a, a a much more focused, compressed, intense mm -hmm. um, opera in a setting in the recent past in Scotland, with some references back to some of the stranger and darker episodes of Scottish history, because obviously in Scotland. There is a strong fantasy tradition, there's a strong history of interest in witchcraft and stuff like that. And a, there are also a sort of flash forward aspect, a look forward to the contemporary and, and the future, because some of the themes in, in this opera resonate with current concerns over with yeah. about things like social media, um, over things like climate change and um, the treatment of the biosphere and the animal world and so on. So in, in all these respects, um, I think we've, we've got something that will appeal to a wide range of people, but particularly to the, the audience at the Glasgow Worldcon. So which island did you set it on in the, in the first of Clyde? Well, it's inspired by a visit that my wife and I did on a wonderful little ship uh, called Tonka. Um, that's a, a, an old um, passenger ferry, I think, which has mm -hmm. been used by a, a Clyde tourism company that operates out of Largs and out mm -hmm. of Greenock. And they take people on, on visits to some of the underexplored parts of the Firth of Clyde. And one of them is Wee Cumbry, or Little Cumbry. Yeah. Wee Cumbry is a, a fascinating little island, and it has its own even weir Cumbry next to it with a, a ruined castle. And it's, you know, you can walk across at low tide at 100 metres or so, and you walk around this old castle. And there's a huge, a big old building, a big house and some little houses on the islands, all uninhabited. And in the past, the big house has been owned by, you know, pop stars, gurus of um, meditation, meditation disciplines and things like that. So it, it has a, a real sort of haunted 
appearance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's got all this interesting past. And even when I when we visited, I, I said to Carol, you know, this could be the setting for an Ian Rankin novel or an Ian Banks novel. It's just so wonderfully um, compact and has such a strange little history of its own. I have a special attachment to the Isle of Cumbria itself because way back in the 1970s, when I myself was a student of zoology at Glasgow University, we did a marine biology mm -hmm. course of a week at what used to be the marine uh, marine biology station outside Millport. Mm -hmm. And that was a, you know, a very national, even, I think, possibly more widely um, significant marine biology research centre. And we had a brilliant time, both <laughs> clumping about, about on the shore, throwing down metre squares of, and uh, rummaging in rock pools and um, all, all that kind of thing, mm -hmm. a little bit of swimming. Some of the bolder spirits even managed to do some scuba diving, which I, I didn't quite manage at that time. But mm -hmm. we had a really, really interesting time at that um, marine biology research station. And I wanted to draw on some of that for the feel. Because another thing about the 70s, and particularly students in the 70s, as I recall them, was that they had they had all they were quite willing to countenance all kinds of strange paranormal pseudoscientific mm -hmm. ideas and even hard-headed zoology students would read the books like lyle watson's supernature which was full of full of the most ridiculous stuff but you know i i say that now it, it was full of fascinating speculative stuff and and not very well supported accounts of um, uh, strange phenomena associated with biology. So it was kind of intriguing and little did we know that far more um, knowledgeable and significant people than ourselves were also looking at this kind of material with great interest and wondering what are the military applications? So it could have been a setting for an Ian Rankin, it could have been a setting for an Ian Banks, and it's turned into a setting for a, a Ken McLeod and Gary uh, Lloyd opera instead. So, And obviously it's somewhere if people come to see the opera, they can actually go and visit while they're in Glasgow. Have you, you know, working to the music or working with Gary, has there been anything in particular other than learning that, you know, is a much more compressed thing than you first imagined? Um, I, I had only seen one opera, I think, in my life, and that was a, an operatic version of a novel by uh, Andrew Gregg, the, the Scottish poet and novelist, mm -hmm. and was a, a, a brilliant op modern opera based around his novel, When They Lay Bare. And I ha so I had some rough idea, and I had used that in my my own, um, what, what I learned from that in, in my own novel, um, Newton's Wake, which is subtitled A Space Opera, mm -hmm. and because it actually has operas in it. And uh, Gary thought, when he, when he read the extracts from Newton's Wake, he thought I had sort of got the idea right. But he's, he's very kindly sent me um, CDs of modern operas, like by Philip Glass mm -hmm. and um, Oh, I can reach for it right now. Oh, where is it? Oh, yes, and libretti, a libretto is the right word for a script for an opera. All and right, yeah. Yeah, see, he's lent me these books mm -hmm. and he sent me a couple of CDs. Yes, like this one, Hydrogen Sonata. Ah, right, which, okay. Yes, which is, you know, very, very useful to me for shaking me out of the Hollywood musical style, yeah. <laughs> imagining what, what we were doing. And um, I've written the libretto and I've turned it over to Gary. And I mean, Gary can and will do work his magic on him. So I'm very much looking forward to 
finding out how Gary will translate this into something. I think music. You're not alone in that. I think we are. We're all looking forward to um, putting the glad rags on and and sitting down um, in the armadillo and watching this unfold in Glasgow with with the honour of your presence there, which will be really wonderful. Um, and so. I think it's probably fair to say this is a, a very cool thing for, for us. Um, it's a very cool thing to be involved around um, and hopefully uh, we'll get some kind of snippets later on so that we can, we can hear it. But um, it, it's a really nice thing to think one year out and there will be a world premiere of um, a brand new opera at Glasgow Worldcon. Um, and if people are so inspired um, and their imaginations peaked. They can go and see the coastline and, and sort of get a sense of what could they imagine out there on the island. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about this, and you know, it it, it feels I, I can feel in, inside myself as you were speaking. I could feel a sort of tremor of excitement because it's such a big thing we're doing, and um. I, I, I'm very confident in it, but very nervous as well. So, well, well it's a whole new venture, isn't it? Yes, it's yes. been a learning experience at the same time. And I guess no pressure. It's a learning experience on a world stage where you're guest of honour. Yes. <laughs> where, I mean, it means there's a sympathetic audience from the get-go, but it, it's, a, it's an invested audience who are, who are you know, really excited uh, to be part of this this new experience with you. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be brilliant. One kind of I was sort of thinking, what other things are you looking forward to about a Glasgow 2024 Worldcon? Ah. Uh. I'm looking forward to all the usual things I look forward to in a, in a Worldcon session, a Glasgow Worldcon. And these include, you know, for example, the chance to hear and possibly to speak with some of the writers and artists that I admire, mm -hmm. to find new, new writers and meet new people and meet old friends. And there is usually as at the London Worldcon, for example, there is a, a remarkable art show, which I'm sure we'll have at Glasgow. There's the masquerade, which is always fun. There is the Hugo ceremony, which is, which is invariably a, a highlight of the whole thing. Yeah. And all, all of these, these things and, you know, around the Glasgow SEC, and its environs are one of the probably the best sites in Britain to ha have a world con because you're in a, a very some very suitable spaces there's excellent catering on site and getting off site is very straightforward and you're, yeah. you you have very easy access to one of one of the great cities really and and Glasgow is that